proximate causes as limiting factors for ideological thinking. The main point as it pertains to gendered issues and social justice issues more broadly is that when discussing oppressive structures or the way that cultural structures interact and specifically in regards to discussions of the effects of racism, sexism, bigotry, etc., the most proximate cause is the causal force of worth. There can be exceptions in terms of the worth in understanding the roles non-proximate causes play, but critically both in terms of understanding the truth of the matters at hand, in avoiding the strange conspiratorial connections, and in the pragmatics of dealing with the problems, focusing the locus of cause on the proximate cause is quite fruitful. In philosophy this can well be understood as an argument for compatibilism as regards free will in the face of arguments for causal determinism. Meaning that even in a causally determined reality, a free will nonetheless exists, hence the name compatibilism, meaning that free will is compatible with determinism. For this reason, I am going to spell that argument out a bit that folks might have a different frame of reference from which to understand the position. As the causal relation relates to free will and philosophy. Although there are other sorts of arguments, perhaps, for compatibilism, the one I am highlighting here is that the causal regressive chain of thought comes to a halt at the ethically relevant level of consideration. See also the rape of the swan, differentiations in good faith, a forthcoming. Note, I am expanding on accepted law, not merely replicating it here. The ethically relevant agent involved defines the parameters whereby the causal deterministic regression is halted at, rather than primary causes or first causes, the ethically proximate cause is responsible for the action, and hence to the glory or the fallacy of said action. To give a common and real-world example, to say that one's education is the cause of one's actions is to ignore the individual involved as a causal agent, and hence to bypass the proximate causal agent, the person, for some further removed agent, the education per se. Another example, more abstracted, and in some sense therefore more relevant, to say that X is the cause of Y is to say that X determines Y. But for every Y there is also a Z that determines Y. Hence all causal relations are regressive to the primary cause, to the first mover, or the first cause. However, this argument tacitly denies the causal relation between X and Y, as in, Y didn't actually cause X in the first place. Z did. Which is a denial of the premise, and hence the argument for determinism itself is self-referential, in that it referenced the X-Y relation as justification for the X-Z relation, whilst simultaneously denying the X-Y relation to make the claim of the X-Z relation. There is actually some room for argument therein, but here I want to stress the point that the proximate cause thereof is the X-Y relation, not the X-Z relation. The compatibilist simply holds the line strongly at the point that there is an ethically relevant agent responsible for the actions of X, namely, Y, such that Z isn't responsible for the action X. By holding the ground strongly the causal regression doesn't occur. I am responsible for my actions based on my ethical agency, and so too therefore is their free will despite the existence of a causal chain of events that overall describes the actions. As the causal regression relates to social justice, as the proximate cause saves it. This will amount to a serious criticism of intersectionality as a mode of ideological understanding of cultural forces. But it also works to criticize a vast array of conspiratorial thinking without necessarily dismissing the notions of conspiracies or non-proximate causes. So we are all on the same page, there are two main definitions and uses of proximate causes, both of which are relevant. The legal use of proximate cause is that event which directly leads to injury, damage or harm. The philosophical concept is that event which is most immediately causally related for some observed result. In the former we are concerned with specific damages, and such may actually entail a non-immediate causal relation to the observed result. In other words, the next to proximate cause, in the philosophical sense, could be more damaging to the observed result. In abstracted terms, while Y might be the most immediate proximate causal agent upon X, it may still be the case that Z is the more damaging causal agent in the causal chain, and hence Z not Y is the proximate causal agent of not. We would do well to broaden that a bit to hold that it is what causal agent is more impactful to the observed result, so as to avoid the connotations of harm for the action. Perhaps Z helps X more than Y does, despite the fact that Y is the more immediate causal relation. 
folks may well get a sense of how that relates to social justice issues and intersectionality broadly merely by the definition and concept. Whereas the philosophical concept of proximate cause is in counterbalance to the notions that some further in the past event was the actual cause simply because it occurred earlier in the time frame. This is helpful for a wide variety of reasons, but here I want to focus on the reality that it provides agency of action within the discourse. See also the point as regards compatibilism, as those two are strongly related to the points being made here as a counterargument to intersectionality. Meaning that the agency of an event resides more firmly within the proximate cause rather than attempting to pass the responsibility to some other more distantly related cause. To quote the poets. See, a eh honey, I am not some broken thing. I do not lay here in the dark waiting for thee. No, my heart is gold. My feet are light. And I am racing out on the desert plains all night. To say, for instance, that so and so made the meal because they were hungry is perhaps a proximate cause to the action of making the meal. Whereas to say so and so made the meal because thus and such made them hungry would be to place the onus of the causal force on thus and such instead of on the hunger they felt, the hunger which is them. The former would be the brute philosophical context for the use of the term. It just bluntly halts the causal regression by maintaining that the agency of being hungry resides firmly with the person who is hungry. The latter is more like the legal context for the use of the term. Thus and such is responsible for the hunger that so and so feels, and hence thus and such is the active agent involved for the hunger. The former can sometimes miss obvious plays of power, as in, so and so had a gun to their head and thus they made the meal. Ah, uh, but they themselves were the proximate cause, they could have said no after all, and besides which they were hungry too were they not. They had the agency to do so. See also the series on power dynamics, inequalities, link in the description. Folks can get a sense here of the source for the problems associated with the just bootstrap it crowd. The latter can sometimes miss the obvious aspects of agency that people have, as in, so and so didn't make the meal because they were hungry, they made the meal because it was that time of day to make a meal. They aren't causing their own hunger, after all, it is time itself that made them hungry, they are just passive victims of temporality. Folks can get a sense here of the source for the problems associated with the I am not responsible for any of my actions crowd. When folks analyze cultural phenomena and they point to specific broad cultural structures like matriarchy, patriarchy, heteronormativity, white supremacy, racial supremacy, capitalism, etc. We can understand such as a matter of proximate causes for a limiting factor to intersectionalist kinds of claims. To say for instance that some anti-trans phenomena is spawned by bigotry would be to hold that such is the proximate causal relation to the anti-trans phenomena. To hold that the anti-trans phenomena is spawned by upholding the patriarchy and white supremacy is to make a claim that non-proximate causes are actually more influential or more meaningfully applicable to the anti-trans phenomena. Those latter sorts of structures, insofar as they may be in play at all, are not proximate causes to the anti-trans phenomena. The understanding of how, say, matriarchy might be a causal force to anti-trans phenomena is interesting, but it doesn't necessarily entail that such is the ultimate cause or the most influential cause. To note if for instance that the current kerfuffle with TAFs and gender criticals is really about matriarchy, which it is imho, is to hold that matriarchy is the more influential causal force in play despite the fact that the most immediate force in play is bigotry. Note that this is widely distinct from the claim that, for relevant instance, the patriarchy is to blame. For, the relevant medium of causal action is women, and hence we could reasonably conclude that the most immediately obvious force in play would be matriarchy, without there being some further argument or reason to suppose otherwise. Women are the primary doers of the things here, the men and we might surmise the patriarchy are at most only secondarily causal relations. We might even suppose that patriarchy would perhaps even be opposed to the point, after all the issues in play therein are primarily about men being excluded from women's spaces more broadly. The intersectionalist claims that the proximate causal forces and actors are not actually ethically responsible, nor ultimately responsible for their actions, rather, patriarchy is, or perhaps some other further removed social phenomena, due to a supposition that the further removed causally related force is more powerful and hence secretly the directing force. 
all evidence to the contrary be damned. This seems clear enough as there are loads of toughs and gender criticals who are fine with queer people including trans people but they have spheres of influence within the matriarchy that they feel threatened by having a trans person within it. Matriarchy causes the tough and gender critical response. Patriarchy is at best one step removed as a causal force. We can draw pretty lines to it but in real terms there just isn't much actual causal relation there. It isn't and wasn't patriarchal concerns that sparked the toughs and the gender criticals, even if we might also see dudes who are likely making patriarchal claims such as Matt Walsh surrounding tough and gender critical talking points. They and their concerns simply did not have the proximate power to force the issue. I'd go so far as to say that those folks are cucks to women that they are not espousing masculine concerns, they are mouthing feminine concerns regarding femininity. Men did not initiate, cause, or maintain the points of toughs. Women did. Women lead on that bigotry. Women are the ones crying foul over the point. Women are the ones that are perturbed by the presence of trans people in their spaces. The whole kerfuffle has as its proximate cause in both the philosophical and the legal sense centered on matriarchy. To attempt to obfuscate that by holding to an intersectional analysis is to do a major disservice to the problem. Specifically it is to misdiagnose what is happening and hence to target forces that are not proximately responsible for the anti-trans phenomena. To say that it's patriarchy or it's white supremacy is to aim poorly in all endeavors at addressing the problem. And here I think we see a major weakness in intersectional analysis, it regularly and unthinkingly holds to non-proximate causes by pretending that further distanced causal forces, ultimate causes, are also the most damaging or harmful causal forces. Along the way it denies the agency of actors who do things in closer proximity to the phenomena and who arguably and I'd even say intuitively obviously are far more likely to be the actual causal force of interest when attempting to deal with the phenomena. To spell it out directly, intersectionalism holds that the causal relations are universally applicable based on ultimate causal forces regardless of more localized forces. It says if for instance, white supremacy is the cause of environmental degradation because the theory holds that the power relations of not hold the same across an indefinite number of causal relations. Since white supremacy is supposedly an overarching power structure, it bears responsibility for why it is that some community of non-whites somewhere in the world are polluting and destroying their environment. Rather than the more obvious local factors that may be in play and far more obviously relevant as causal forces of not. In other words, proximate causes. I want to give an example here that provides a clearer picture as to how ineffectual and pragmatically useless intersectional analysis can be the systemically impoverished person. They are such by type it be that type race and or class. We can point to how patriarchy or heteronormativity or some version of racial supremacy thinking ultimately causes their poverty, but the reality of it is very likely that capitalism caused their poverty. Because that is the relevant broad social causal force in play. To push that point to how supposedly capitalism uphold patriarchy, or matriarchy, or racial supremacy notions is to miss the reality that capitalism is its own thing which directly causes the phenomena of poverty as we experience it today at any rate. Racism or sexism may also play a role but that role whatsoever it be would be one that occurs primarily within the economic contexts, as that is how capitalism actually functions. Neither racism, nor sexism, nor their conjunctions would be the relevant causal force in play. Capitalism itself would be. So folks focus on, say, anti-woman sexism instead of the problems of capitalism as if by addressing the former one is actually addressing the latter. Which would only make any pragmatic sense at all if anti-woman sexism actually was causally relevant to systemic poverty within capitalism. Which I mean, at best at most that would be a huge stretch. This is why such things as black capitalism or girl boss feminism are just inevitably going to be failures. They take intersectionality seriously, such that to them merely helping out minorities somehow or another actually deals with the problems of capitalism, or if not capitalism, some other distantly related phenomena of concern. 
which isn't even to suggest that such doesn't deal with some other sort of problem, don't get me wrong, helping out the poor or minorities helps with those problems, but doing so doesn't actually address the broader problems, which if intersectionality were true they would. As proximate cause relates to liberalism, the rugged individualism. Conversely proximate cause also neatly handles the bootstrap hardcore mode freaks. Specifically, the notion of agency as such resides with the philosophical context of proximate cause in that the philosophical proximate cause holds the causal regressive thought and firmly grounds the agency of action prima facie with the individual. Which again on its own in a naive sense would claim that poverty is caused by the poor themselves. They choose to be poor or whatever. They just lazy or they have personal problems that they need to overcome on a personal level. For those folks they are missing the reality that the more influential causal structure, capitalism, is the proximate causal force in play. To be blunt, they are also misdiagnosing the problem, and hence failing to really even have hope of addressing it before they are mistaking their own agency, which they have in virtue of being the proximate causal agent in the philosophical sense, for being the relevant influential or ethically responsible causal force. Folks can here get a good sense of the differentiations between the individual causal agent and the larger scalar structures within which individual causal agents functionally operate. This or that other causal agent may be more influential on thus and such a causal agent cause that is how causal forces work, they cause things to happen. It so happens that there are broad distinctions to be made between scalar causal forces, in this case the rather obviously coercive forces of economics plays a pretty widely outside causal role in determining why the poor are poor. Which is why those larger scalar causal forces are the proximate cause in this case, but not that folks ought not mistake the difference in scale as necessarily being a difference in causal force. Larger scalar does not necessitate more powerful, oft local scalars, small scalars, have overriding power of causal effect. But the point here is that we can properly understand the issues by way of proximate causes. They aren't just lazy or whatever, there are actual real social structures that actively influence them to such an extent that they end up becoming or staying poor. How proximate causal relations differentiate proper thinking from conspiratorial thinking and ineffective thinking? Proximate causal relations well defines the parameters of thinking such that to fall outside of them is to either be thinking in a conspiratorial way, which is inherently ineffectual, or just an ineffectual way. To hold that some non-proximate cause is in fact the relevant causal force is to misperceive the causal relations and ascribe to the actions in the going-ons in the world to some relatively inert agent. To say that the patriarchy is responsible for the current kerfuffle surrounding tasks and gender criticals is to engage with both conspiratorial and ineffectual thinking of the problem. Its conspiratorialness deriving from the misdiagnosis of the problem to some further removed agent than that which is the actual proximate causal force of relevance. Its ineffectualness stemming from exactly the same thing. There is also however an ineffectualness that isn't conspiratorial, namely, by ignoring proximate causal forces beyond that of personal agency. Between the a somewhat modified legal understanding of proximate cause and the philosophical understanding of proximate cause, we can get a grip on what the reality of the situations are by avoiding both conspiratorial tendencies towards ultimate causes and the tendencies to ignore forces other than one's own self. As a boon, such also well defines agency in a way that is neither hyper nor hypo, which ought not be overly surprising given that proximate causal relations is primarily derived as a means of describing compatibilism, that is, how agency works within a causally determined system. Summary of how proximate causal relations addresses the broad problems in the current. Proximate causes as a broad tool cuts through the BS on the left and the right by blocking conspiratorial thinking, outlining what the proper targets are for a given issue, and providing a means of distinguishing between actions of personal agency and those of social force. In terms of intersectionality, proximate causes derails the causal regressive thinking that attempts to posit as fundamental cause some far distant related phenomenon, which we can also well understand as conspiratorial thinking. Understanding such things as being most relevant to the most proximate causal relation provides a sound means of analyzing the circumstances so as to better direct efforts at addressing the problems. Intersectionality simply fails entirely to properly diagnose problems. 
We can also understand that sort of problem as hypoagency, the tendency to deny one's own agency in a phenomena as a means of avoiding blame or glory for the circumstances. Conversely, proximate causes avoids the issues of individualism, liberalism, which places the ethical owner squarely on the individual in all circumstances whatsoever. We can also understand that as a sort of problem as hyperagency, the tendency to deny the existence of other causal agents and forces as a means of taking on to oneself the glory and blame of all phenomena. Primary songs of relevance here. Song of Zula and the Stable Song. The former, I'd say such emancipated us from the causally determined mode. The latter, I mean, were we the belly of the beast or the sword that fell? will never tell, is a line that I think no one shall ever again forget. As if all of philosophy hummed for a time, now I've been crazy, couldn't you tell. I threw stones at the stars, but the whole sky fell. 